Hello everybody, it's Michael Harbridge coming to you from Wisconsin. We're a little bit earlier with our live this evening. Um, tonight we're going to be working on um, coil and extruder pumpkins. And I'm going to show you all kinds of stuff with that. We're going to give a couple minutes for people to get in here and find the room. Um, you don't need to say mystery box tonight. I think most of you are getting used to. We're not doing the mystery box. We now have project boxes that I'll talk about at the end tonight that has everything in it that we're working with tonight um, with some fantastic deals. And tonight we're going to be doing the, the coil pumpkins. Um, so we've got extruders, we've got rubber leaves, we've got the clay puzzling molds, we've got the press tools, um, got all kinds of cool stuff that'll be in that kit. Um, so we're going to just give an, another couple seconds here. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to start over because we're editing these videos. And so I'll just start over. I'll pause here for a second and, and start again. Hello, everybody. Thank you for joining me. I'm Michael Harbridge coming to you from Wisconsin. Um, we are doing extruder pumpkins tonight, and I'm going to show you how to make those pieces, and we'll talk about some different finishes and things, too. My wife Janine is here if you're watching the live um, event, and she'll be watching for questions that pop up. If you're watching this recording later, um, you can feel free to ask questions, and we'll try to answer those questions uh, when we can. So we're going to be doing the extruder pumpkins. We're going to be using uh, the clay puzzling molds pumpkins. There are several different versions and sizes of these. We're going to be using clay extruder gun to make the coils. You can also roll these coils by hand, um, but it's a lot more work and you'll see in a minute how easy it is to use this extruder. And then we're going to be using the rubber leaf forms to make our leaves for our pumpkins as well. So I'll show you different types of extruders. There's two different types. Um, there is the Shimpo, Nedic Shimpo extruder which is the a little bit shorter one. The barrel's a little shorter. Um, and then we have the Kemper one that has a longer barrel on it. Basically works the same, has a trigger on there. What I like about the bigger one is when I'm doing workshops, I have to load it less frequently than I do the small one. Um, and they each come with different dies. So the Kemper extruder comes with um, three circle dies. There's a small, medium, and large. And then it also has um, our three-hole die that comes with it, which is what I'm going to be working with tonight. And these dies are interchangeable with both of the extruders. These are also sold individually. The Shimpo, Nedic Shimpo extruder, comes with an assortment of different dies. It's got a square, it's got a large circle, it's got a triangle, it's got what I call the ribbon die or the rectangle, it's got the spaghetti die, and in the kit that we're going to be selling tonight, the project kit for this technique, we're also throwing in that three-hole die with the, the Shimpo, Nedic Shimpo extruder. So that will be available on both of those. It's exclusive to tonight's workshop um, for that. Um, so when you go to load the extruder, this is done. Um, there's a trigger on the end that needs to be pushed in, and there's a plunger inside here that when I pull back on this end, when I push in on that trigger, and I pull this back, it pulls that plunger back into the extruder so that I can take and drop a coil of clay down inside here. And I've got a coil prepared, and I'm just going to take, and I usually make it a little bit smaller than the tube so that it drops down in there easily. The end that screws on, that die drops in there. And I like using this three-hole die. There is a single-hole die that comes with this uh, Kemper extruder, and that one will extrude one coil at a time, and this die is going to extrude three of that size coil. When you squeeze this trigger, most people have a tendency to hold it this way and squeeze the trigger, and that makes sense. Sometimes if your hand isn't big enough or you don't have enough strength, um, turning it upside down is a little bit easier. Or take and put this on, if I get this up high enough, put the plunger on the table so it's on a, a surface, and then take your hand and push down this way so you can get better leverage pressing straight down on this and get better pressure if you have a hard time squeezing it upside down or straight. I'm going to flip the, the camera down here. Let me get the extruder I'm not using out of the way. We're going to flip the camera down, and I'll show you then how I extrude the clay and how we're going to put those into the mold. So the trigger on here, the plunger is back because there's clay inside there. 
I'm going to take and squeeze this trigger. And when you first squeeze it, nothing is going to come out because it's compressing the clay inside and it's getting rid of the air. Sometimes you'll get a little bit of a popping sound as that clay starts to come out. So don't stick this up and look straight at the end or put it in somebody else's face. And so I can take and extrude a whole bunch of coils. And you can see with this, so there's that popping sound. Sometimes there's just a little air pocket in there. Um, I can extrude a bunch of coils out. Don't extrude these way ahead of time. Um, extrude them when you're ready to do your project because if you extrude them too far in advance, they tend to stick together. Or one time I put them in plastic and overnight they just, the condensation inside the plastic, they just turned into mush. The clay puzzling molds come with a Velcro strap. They're a two piece mold. Remove that Velcro strap, open it up, and you're going to work in both halves of the mold. I'll pull my coils back here a little bit. And you want to try to keep the coils kind of long. Um, a lot of times people want to break these apart and make lots of little loops like this when they set them in the mold. And it's best if you have kind of long, continuous coils. At times, you may need to make little ones. But when you first start out, we're just going to take and we're going to take that end of the coil and we're going to attach it to another coil. If you don't do that, and this just is hanging out there on the extruder techniques with any of the clay puzzling extruder techniques, sometimes you get little sharp points on the end of that and, and later you just don't have as good of a finish. So I usually start out with that loop and then I take the coil and I start laying it inside the mold. And I always tell people in workshops, try to do kind of like figure eights or make sure that the coils are crisscrossing one another. What you don't want, and I'll show you in a minute, I'm going to use up this coil, and you can see how I'm overlapping. Now when I get to the end of that coil, I want to make sure that the end of that coil also goes on top of another coil. I'm not just going to have this hanging out there. I want that to end on top of a coil. I've just got a washcloth here, and I periodically will go and use that to kind of compress those coils. Now I'm not pressing so hard that I'm flattening them completely, but I'm pressing them hard enough that they stick together. Normally you would score and slip with clay when you would be attaching pieces. With this, just pressing them um, usually compresses it together well. I want the coils to crisscross one another. What I don't want to see, and I'm just gonna do it in the other half of this mold so it's easier for you to see, is sometimes people will put coils in and they will just have them butting up next to each other. So if you do your technique like this and the coils don't cross over one another, they just touch each other, you're not going to have as strong and stable of a piece as you will if you crisscross those coils so they go across one another and they attach on top of each other. They're not just coming up next to each other, but they're actually crossing. So try to cross as much as you can. Do one half of the mold at a time. So, and, and you'll have some shorter pieces of coils like this, and it's fine to use those, but it's not necessary to break the coils apart into little pieces because your piece is going to be more fragile. And so every time I lay another coil in here, I touch the end down and have it overlapping another coil. I try to go in circles or figure eights when I'm doing this. Again, as long of coils as I can. And then people always ask, well, how, how tight should this be with coils? I always say, if I can take my thumb and I can stick it into an opening, that opening is too big. I want some coils to cross over that. So as I add the coils of clay, I'm going to loop these around and try to fill everything in so that I don't have real big openings. And I'm just going to go up to the edge of the mold. I'm not going to go past the seam line on the mold. And I also want to go on the bottom. And on the very bottom of the piece, I'm going to put a few extra coils, and I'll explain that in a minute when we get to that bottom part. Also look for, what I look for in workshops is long, skinny sections. And long, skinny sections, you may not be able to get your thumb in there, 
but if it's a long opening, you probably want to have some coils crossing over on there. Do we have some questions? Someone asked, hi, how are you doing? Oh, okay. Well, there <laughs> I'm is great. a few people still commenting mystery box, but they'll oh. learn more about that at the end. Yep. <clears throat> no mystery box, but we have project boxes that I'll talk about at the end tonight. All right, so now I've got you know, most of the coils in there. And on the bigger pumpkins, there's three different sizes of these. A lot of times I'll press the sections before I get too far on it because sometimes as you go up the side of the mold, it wants to kind of slide down in. Now, what I look for in workshops when I'm teaching this, and the reason I like using a washcloth is because it's got some texture. And so I can look inside that mold and I can see that bumpy texture on those coils. And what I look for are areas where I see smooth coil because that usually is a sign that it wasn't pressed hard enough. And right here, there's a little bit of texture, but watch what happens. See how easily that coil pops off of there. And so I'm looking for areas where I don't see the texture in that coil, and I'll say go back and press those areas. And so that texture lets me know that this has been pressed well. But again, I don't want you to press so hard that these coils become paper thin. You're only pressing hard enough. They're still kind of rounded. They're not completely flattened. So don't press so hard that they're paper thin. Now, I talked about the bottom of the piece that I usually will do a few extra coils on the bottom. And the reason I do that is because when I take this out of the mold, if there's one little coil hanging out here and there's a loop, when I go to stand that piece up and I go to move it, it's going to be more fragile on the bottom and it'll be easy to break a coil like this one away. So I'll go back and add a few, usually two to three rows of coils, just kind of back and forth on the bottom so that the bottom is pretty solid. And then I'll press that with the towel as well. Um, someone was asking about the cloth being wet or dry, and I'm actually tell, typing that in. Yep, dry. that's dry. Yep, someone good, else good question. Asked, and then Lisa did answer um, if you use cornstarch or spray oil to keep them from adhering to the mold, but it's not necessary. No, because these molds are ceramic bisque, and it's not necessary to put anything in the mold. You want the mold to be dry. If I do um, workshops with these pumpkins, and, and we do have 10 people using this mold, in a row, it, it's gonna get kind of damp and sticky and the clay is gonna stick a little more. So the drier the mold is, the better. Um, Cornstarch isn't necessary, it will release because the, the earthenware bisque will absorb moisture from the clay so that it releases easily. Now, one of the things that, that I, I look for again is big openings. And if I can get my thumb into an opening, I usually will run a coil across. And this is where you might end up having like a section here or there where you might break off a little piece of a coil. Um, but there's actually right along this side here, I'm just going to take, touch this coil down here, and I'm going to run it right down that side where I need that extra coil, and I'm going to press it. Now the other thing, be careful that you don't take too long to do this. And, and when I say too long, like, don't do half of this and walk away for a half hour and come back and do the other half because it will tend to dry out um, because that mold will absorb the moisture. You want to kind of do this quickly. And the, again, the coils don't need to go up past that seam line. If they do, just kind of press them down because when you put these two mold halves together, you don't want clay sticking above that will get caught in between. And now I'll do this other half and you'll see when I'm not talking and explaining like how quick it is to actually do a piece like this. Some people look at this technique and they think, oh my gosh, that is so intricate. And I always had people asking when I first started showing the coil techniques, they would ask if I sat there and cut, if this was solid, cast, and then I sat and cut all of the openings out and I'm like oh dear god no that would be horrible to cut all of that out so these coils really and that's and this is where too I had mentioned in the beginning that you could roll these coils by hand if you don't have an extruder but an extruder is one of those things that you don't realize 
how much you need an extruder until you have an extruder and you're like, oh, I never want to roll coils by hand again. The other thing that happens when people are rolling by hand is your hands take a lot of moisture out of the clay and quite often that makes for um, drier coils when you're putting them inside the mold and they tend to want to break more. When you run them through an extruder, it doesn't take moisture out. I'm also working on this craft foam that I get in like 12 packs at craft stores or even Walmart has it. Um, and this craft foam doesn't absorb moisture like canvas does. And so your clay coils don't dry out and they don't stick. Um, and they also don't get texture to them like you can get with canvas. Now I've got most of this filled in and I'm just going along adding a couple coils to mm -hmm. fill in big openings and then I'm going to add coils to the bottom. Someone says we have interesting accents here. Interesting <laughs> accents, yes, we have that Wisconsin yeah. accent. And um, Lisa says she could probably do it every day and still not be as fast as you are. Well, <laughs> I have done this technique quite a bit. I've taught a lot of workshops and one of the first workshops, the first workshop that I did actually um, doing this coil technique was at a trade show. It was a three-day show and I did free make and takes doing these pumpkins in the booth and I sat there for three days squeezing that trigger on that extruder and my my arms at the end were just like blubber. My hands at the the, the day after the show I could hardly even pick anything up. My my arms were so mm -hmm. sore from that. Sometimes people put a little bit too much thought into this part of the process and they're just real particular. I just sat here and went back and forth and looped over and I didn't worry so much about exactly how the coils are placed. Um, sometimes people think maybe they got a little solid like this area here. I've got a lot of coils. But when I open this up from the outside, you're going to see all those coils overlapping. If you really didn't like how solid it was in an area, you could take a needle tool and you could cut some of that out. I don't usually recommend that because you'll see when I take this out how cool it is and how you see those coils overlapping differently from the outside. Now the next step, I've got both molds with the coils going up to the seam and it's not like I have to have a straight line of coils going. There might be some little openings in here and that's okay. I just don't want huge dips going down where I've got big areas, but a little bit of the mold showing along that edge is fine. But to attach both of these with the coil technique, we need to add loops to one side of the mold. So it's only on one half of the mold. I extruded some more coils here and we're going to make loops that stick up about an inch and they're going to go all the way around this mold. Don't add these loops until you have both halves of your mold done with coils on the inside because if I do this side and fill it with coils and I add these loops and then I go to this side and I'm not real fast with that, these loops will start to dry out. So this is kind of the last thing that you do when you're ready to put these together. And I'm going to go all the way around all the sides except for the very bottom. And I don't want these coils to stick up more than an inch. If you go up too high with these coils, when we do the next step of flipping them inward, if they're too tall, they get top heavy and they want to break off. Um, I'm going to go along and just gently press these to make sure that they're attached on the inside. Um, I also, you know, on the, the very last loop here, I did one individual loop like this and stuck it on there. Try to, to have this to be a long continuous coil. It may come to a certain point and then you have to do another coil, but don't break each of these off into individual loops and stick them on because again, that makes your piece more fragile. Now, before we can put these together, these loops right now are sticking out. And if I take this half of the mold and put it on top, these loops are going to get caught between the two halves and they're going to break off. So this is where I have to bend these inward. And if I had done these loops before I did this side, they might get a little dry. And then when I go to bend them in, they want to crack and break off. So that's why I say don't do it too early. Bend them in far enough 
that when you put that mold on there, the clay on this isn't going to hit those and catch them. So they're bent inward quite a bit. I'm going to hold that up and you can see how bent in they are inside the mold. I'm going to flip this around just because the way I'm looking at it, um, I usually have both of these halves in the same direction. I have the bottom here. And as I pick this up, I want to have my hands around the edges. So as I turn this over, if that clay wants to flop out, my fingers are holding it and preventing that from happening. On the taller pumpkins, I might do it this way where I'm holding the top and the bottom. Um, on this little one, I'm just going to do it from the sides. And I'm going to flip this over and I'm going to set this straight down. And as I set that on there, I pull my fingers out, put the two halves of the mold together. And then I take the Velcro strap and wrap that around the mold. And I want to take this and I'm holding, oops, I gotta take this. There's a, a positive or a male and a female part to the Velcro. And so I want to wrap this around. And as I come around the mold, I want to hold this one with these fingers and then pull this really nice and tight as I put that Velcro down so that the mold is together nice and tight. Now, it's hard to see on the inside of here. Um, so we've got a press tool to get inside of these. And on that press tool, there is a little flashlight that is Velcroed on so that when I stand this mold up and I put this tool inside here, the light will shine inside and you can see the coils going down. Get this turned right, that side of the mold. So the coils are on this side of the mold and I want to take and I want to press them to this side of the mold. So I'm going to go in with that press tool and I'm just standing up so I can look straight down in here and I'm just taking and I'm holding the mold and then I'm taking that tool and I'm just kind of going in and I'm going like this and I'm pushing it against each coil working my way from the top of the pumpkin all the way to the bottom where I'm holding this. I don't want to take the tool and drag it up and down in there like we would on a solid puzzling technique because, of course, you've got coils in there and you don't want to break those coils off. As I smack the camera here with the tool, I'm looking at the screen and not watching what my hands are doing. And I'm just going to go along and press a little bit more. One of the things that I want to make sure of when I open this, and I'll show you what to look for when you open the mold, because the nice thing is you can open these immediately. You don't have to wait for them to set up. And I can take that Velcro off, and then I can just take and kind of wiggle that mold. Now, if it doesn't come apart easily, <laughs> and of course this one isn't coming apart easily now, um, sometimes if the clay is real wet, it will stick to the mold a little bit. Don't be real forceful with it. If you have to let it set in the mold for a little while, you can do that. Um, you don't want to rip it apart. But what I look for when I take that first half off of the mold is I look right along that seam line. Because if I don't press hard enough with that tool on the inside, it doesn't push the coil that's joining the two halves out to the edge of the mold. And I didn't press this one super hard and you can see I'm going to pop this out of the mold all the way. So you can see right along here, there's a little bit of a dip because I didn't press as hard to get those coils all the way out to the edge. So if I see that happening in the mold, I would normally, I wouldn't pull it out of the mold like that. I would leave it in the mold. I would put the mold back together. And I've done this enough times that I have a pretty good sense for how hard I need to press to get that out, but I, I didn't press as hard as I normally would because I wanted to show you guys how that, what I look for in a workshop. And I'd rather have people not press hard enough and have to put the half of the mold back on there and go back in and press again than I would that they press so hard that they flatten the coils out paper thin or they snap their press tool. These are made with oak. They're pretty strong, but I have had a couple of them. People get really forceful and they actually snap the tool in a workshop. So I'm going to pop that out of the mold. Now, on a small pumpkin like this, I'll be able to take this out of the mold right away. But on the bigger sizes, I might leave it in the mold for a little while because I'll take and I'll feel that bottom. And if the bottom is real squishy and it's the taller, bigger pumpkin, I might leave it in this half of the mold for a little while. I might put it in front of a fan 
to dry the bottom a little bit and firm that up. I might set it outside in the sun or I might take a hair dryer or a heat gun to try and set that up. You can see the bottom of this is fairly solid and that's where I talked about the coils of adding a few extra in the bottom so that your piece has a nice solid bottom to it and it's not just one thin coil that as soon as you set it down it's going to snap that coil off. To get it out of the mold on the other side, I usually just take and flip it over into my hand and then wiggle the other half of it off and I've got my piece that I can stand up. Now on the pumpkin, some of them, the way the top of the mold is, there's a little bit of an indentation where the stem is. We're going to make a stem to go on here. <clears throat> so you don't want to force clay up in there as you're putting your coils in. If you do, it might get hung up in there a little bit. And if it does, you might have to go up and kind of pull that clay away to get it out of that half of the mold where the stem is on there. Someone's just asking what kind of clay you're using. I'm working with um, Raku clay. Um, I'm torn of whether I want to Raku fire these pumpkins when they're done or if um, I actually, I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to use those metallic colors that I showed a couple weeks ago. Those metallic creams, I think these pumpkins will be so cool done in those because it'll look almost like a, a full Raku type finish. I'm just setting this on a board so it's easy to turn, but the, the pumpkin, it's pretty soft. I'm going to look where that seam line was, and if there are any bumps there where the coils have a little bit sticking out, I'll just kind of rub those with my finger or pinch those in. This actually looks pretty good um, on the very top here. I'm not worried about the top because my stem is going to go over that. So this is the pumpkin. I'm just looking for the area where, remember I showed you kind of where it looked from the inside like it was solid with coils. This is that area right here. And while there are a lot of coils right there, um, from the outside of the pumpkin, you still see all of those lines and the coils that it doesn't stand out and look like it's too solid there. I don't see anywhere on here other than the bottom that it looks really solid. Um, and on the top, it looks pretty solid because we're going to make a stem that's going to go over the top of that. All right. So making the stem, I just start out with a, a piece of clay. And, and so th the question was about what clay I'm using. I'm using Raku clay. Um, you can use any clay body for this. If you're working with a mid-range stoneware clay body, you know, a B-mix or, or some type of a, a stoneware clay body, that will work. Low fire white, low fire red. One of the advantages to using a red clay, whether it's a low fire or a mid-range or a high fire, is the red clay gives the pumpkin natural color. This will fire out to kind of a buff color, um, which is okay, but the red color or brown color gives your pumpkin color, and especially on the inside, it adds color. All right, so to make a stem, I'm just going to kind of pinch out a cone shape, and it'll be kind of different size depending on how big the pumpkin is. And then I'm going to do kind of like I'm making a pinch pot. I'm going to take my thumb in this thick end of the cone, and I'm going to kind of pinch in and pinch my way around. And so making a pinch pot, you kind of hold from the outside, press your thumb on the inside and press out into those fingers to kind of open that up. And then I'm just going to take a wooden tool that comes in a basic pottery tool set or any type of a, a wooden tool and I'm going to scratch lots of texture in here. We've got a mosquito in here that I'm, I, I really want to swat at. Oh, but I thought that he's, was a fruit fly. No, it's oh. a mosquito. He's bitten my legs about 10 times since this oh, live no. started. I, thought, I saw you like kind of reaching down by your legs yeah, a few times. Yeah, I was scratching. I was like, oh my God, there's a mosquito down there eating my legs alive. <laughs> he should be good and plump by the time we're done with this. So I'm just taking this tool and I'm scratching lots of texture into this. And I can make this stem oh, yeah. as long as I want. And I can twist this around. So I made this one. Did you get him? No. That didn't look like a mosquito. Oh, I don't know. Then there's a. I well, thought it looked there like might also there be might be a mosquito. mosquito it's, yeah. So <laughs> depending how tall you make this will determine how much you can twist and bend this around. But I'm going to give it a twist this way first to make it kind of a little more gnarly, like a pumpkin stem. And then I can take and I can just kind of gradually 
bend this around. I don't want to just take and bend it and snap it. If you've done my gnome workshop or seen my gnome videos, I kind of do the same thing. I just kind of bend it a little, bend it a little, bend it a little, and then I want to open this part up. And so this is going to be my stem. And again, you'll make the size of it based on how big of a pumpkin. And I want that to fit over the top area of the pumpkin. And that's why I said, if you have to dig in there a little bit to get it out of the mold, don't worry if that gets a little chewed up. This is going to go right over it. So I'm going to open this up a little bit more. Now I can take and I can slip and score and, and attach this on here. I tend to not do that because it's a lot easier to paint. If this piece is separate and that piece is separate, I can glaze this, I can glaze that. I can set that on there when I fire it, it fuses right onto the piece. So I'm just kind of taking and pressing it so that it conforms to the top of my pumpkin. And I'll set this aside to dry. And then I'm gonna make leaves. So there's lots of different leaves out there. And one of the, the kits that we have tonight, um, a lot of you I'm sure already have some leaf forms. Um, I'm going to use some of the, the new ones tonight. I'm going to use the new Wisconsin maple leaves. I really love the this versus the original maple that had the deeper indentations. They're great for impressions. These are great for making dimensional leaves. And there's four different sizes of those. There are dogwood leaves, which I really like the texture on these. There's four different ones of those, so we're going to use some of those tonight. Mum leaves are one of my favorites with the pumpkins. There's four different sizes of those. We'll use some of those. There's actual wild pumpkin leaves. There's four different sizes of those. And then the oak leaves, I think, are really cool because you can make them really colorful. So you can use just the pumpkin leaves with your pumpkin. Or if you want to add some other leaves in it to make other fall things, go for it. When you make these, you want to take and flatten out some clay. And all of these leaf forms that I just showed are included in the project kit tonight. If you buy the project kit, project kit comes with the pumpkin molds, it comes with um, the leaves, and it comes with um, a press tool we're going to throw in. And I didn't put this in the listing. I actually forgot about it. I'm like, oh, I forgot to put the press tool in the picture um, and in the description. So this, you're going to get a press tool with the light um, in that assortment. And um, i trying to think what else comes. Then there's one assortment has the extruder. The other one comes without the extruder because not everybody needs the extruder. Some of you have the extruder. Some of you have the leaves. All the items are available individually as well. So when I make the leaves, I flatten the clay out to be about between a, an eighth and a quarter of an inch thick. I don't want it to be too thin. That's one of the biggest mistakes that people make is they make the, the clay really super thin. Then I take and press the leaf into that clay and instead of laying it down and going around and cutting around it with a tool, a wooden tool or a needle tool, I just take and I pull the clay and I kind of peel it back around the edges of that leaf. And this will work with all of the leaves. This is the, like I mentioned, this is the new Wisconsin green maple. Um, this one doesn't have the deep indentations. The original maple leaves are hard to do the, the dimensional or the, the leaves this way, making dimensional leaves. They're great for impressions, but they're kind of a challenge because of the deep, deep grooves in there. Once I've got most of that clay peeled away, then I flip it over and I take my thumb and I kind of pinch downward and I just bevel the edge of this. A lot of people want to make the leaves paper thin and I get it, but they don't release from these forms real well if they are too thin. So if you try to peel this leaf away from the form and it rips and tears, there's a good chance that it's too thin. You want it to be thick, but you get that thin illusion by beveling the edge of the leaf. I don't usually bevel the very bottom of the leaf because that allows me to be able to grab onto that clay and peel that back. Now, if I've got an area like this that my finger couldn't get into, I can take the needle tool and I can cut out that little area inside there. A lot of times I'll show on the next leaf um, taking a tool in there to um, remove clay that's in those indentations. And then I'm going to make a bunch of these leaves and I'm just going to set them aside and then we're going to bend them and shape them a little bit um, before 
we let them dry. I'm going to do the oak leaf because this is a good example of a leaf where you have to use a tool to kind of get the clay out. And so I peel it back. In this too, when I see people sitting there with a needle tool trying to cut around, you see how quickly this goes, doing it this way, doing the pinching and the beveling versus laying it down, cutting it out, and then when you're cutting it out, you're, you're cutting into your foam mat. Now in the oak leaf, there are these deeper indentations. So I'll take this tool with a pointed end and I'll come up from the bottom and just pull that clay right out of those openings. So it kind of bevels the edge and removes the clay in those deep openings. And then I can take and peel and I've got an oak leaf. And so we'll do a mum leaf. Well, let's do a pumpkin leaf since it is a pumpkin. If someone was trying to find this on the project box on your website, would they? So if you go to learnfiredarts.com okay. and up on the top of the screen, there is a shop tab. Click on the shop tab. There's going to be a pop-up that'll come up and you can click that off after you read it. Most people don't read it. They just click mm -hmm. it off. Um, and then it'll take you oh, right into the very first, the very first okay. item. We, we okay. purposely name it number one so that it is the first item that comes up on the website. I was going to try to post the link, but... Um... Yeah, if you just do learnfiredarts.com forward slash shop, it'll take you right into the shopping side of the website. Mm -hmm. But if you just go into learnfiredarts.com and um, you just have to click on the, the shop tab up at the top of the... Yeah. It's the, I, I'm not very <laughs> <savvy>. pumpkin leaf. <laughs> okay. And we'll do a little mum leaf here as well. And I'm taking all of those oh. scraps that I've Thank peeled you, off Lisa. from the other. Did Lisa put a link up there? <laughs> she did. <laughs> Thanks, I think Lisa. Lisa needs to be your assistant instead of me. <laughs> I'm not very like tech savvy. I was in it. I found it, but I couldn't. I don't know how to like copy those. Yeah, so I try to put, and there's, you know, there's the, the tab that's the live event specials. And the live event specials, I try to put everything in there that, that we use during the live. And then there's some new stuff in there, too. Um, but there's lots of other stuff on the website. So you can look in the other categories as well. But I try to make it easy for, for the live you do have the set without the extruder, right? Yeah, so there's a drop-down box. In the number one, when you click on it, it's going to give you that you can select an option, and there's one set that has the extruder, and there's one that does not have the extruder. And the, the pricing on it, it's a great deal. So the with the extruder, it normally would be $275. If you include the press tool in there, you're up to about $290. It's on special for $190, so it's $100 off. And if you do it without the extruder, um, it's normally about $225, and we're doing it for $150. The three pumpkin molds oh, I see. are normally, yep, okay. the gotcha. three pumpkin molds alone are $150. So you're basically getting the leaves and the press tool for free when you order the, the set of the pumpkin molds. Now my leaves, I don't want to just take and put them on there necessarily hanging straight down. And these two, I often will leave these separate because they're a lot easier to paint. And then I will glue them on later and I'll explain about that in a minute. So I don't want them just flat. So I'll usually take and bend the end over kind of where it's going to attach so that it looks like it's kind of growing out from that stem. And then I'll usually give a little bit of a wave to that leaf so that it's not perfectly flat. And I'll set those aside and then I will fire this with the leaves separate. When I paint these and glaze these, I will usually do just a wash on the back of them so that they're not real glossy and shiny. It might be a wash with like a brown or a black glaze. Um, that Most of it is wiped back and so they, they won't stick to the shelf. The top side usually is where I put all the, the glaze on these pieces. Got my maple leaf and I'll kind of set these against there just to see how they will look. So what I do is I paint them or glaze them and fire them. And then once they're all done, if I've fused the top in the glaze firing, the, the top is already on. If I haven't, I can take and put glue in here. If I've done non-fired finishes like I'm thinking of doing with the metallic uh, creams, I'll glue that on. And then I'll put some glue on the leaf, like where it touches here and then where it's going to touch down below. And I'll put a piece of masking tape across there, hold it in place. Once that glue is dry, 
take the tape off and your leaf is permanent on that piece. So I'm just going to, this piece is pretty soft, but I want to just kind of hold this up with a couple leaves just kind of sitting on here to give you an idea, do a balancing act here of how those leaves are going to look on there. And there's quite a few things to feel. Okay. Okay, so what is the turnaround time when you order? Um, right now we have, that's a really good question, we have um, about 150 orders right now to fill. So the last live that I did, we did the watercolor technique. And we got our order in from Royal that had all the watercolor and the aqua brushes. We're waiting for an order right now from Mako um, that we ran out of the um, thin and shade, the Duncan thin and shade. So we're waiting for that to come in. We're anticipating that arriving any day. Um, so we're hoping by next week that every order, all of the retro tree molds will be shipping this week. Everybody who's waiting for retro trees, they'll be shipping this week. And, and when I say this week, we might be packing them yet on the weekend. Um, so they'll ship probably on Monday. Um, pretty much all of the clay puzzling molds will be caught up this week, including, I'm going to just lift the camera up here, the giant cone, which is back here. Oh, this, gosh, I have to, we're finally, this cone is in production. This cone is 27 inches high, and we only have two more orders to fill on those, and then we'll actually be ahead on those. So next week, we'll be caught up on those. The pumpkin molds, um, we can get a lot of these out every week. So you're looking at, depending how many orders come in, um, any orders that come in tonight probably should ship next week. Um, if we get like 200 orders tonight, it might be a little bit longer than that. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to keep an eye on it tonight. And if I see a ton of orders coming in, I'll adjust the listing and I'll try to list like, you know, shipping mid-September, shipping late September, if a ton of orders come in. I don't anticipate getting hundreds of orders tonight, probably, for those. Um, extruders, we have quite a few of those in stock. Um, leaves, we There's actually... A, actually, a question about the extruders. Okay. Which one comes with the kit? So the one that comes with the kit is the shorter, the Nedic Shimpo one that comes with it. But, like I mentioned earlier, we're including that three-hole die that I used. Normally doesn't come with that one. We're including that with it tonight, too, as a bonus. Comes with that in the kit. How long do you wait to press the clay in the molds? How long do I wait to press the clay in the mold? So the pressing with the washcloth, I will do that throughout the process. So I might do a little area inside the mold, and then I will take the towel and I'll go like this and I'll press the area, and then I'll do some more. Because on the small pumpkin, it's not a, a big deal. But when you go to the big pumpkin, this one, if you start putting a lot of coils inside here, and you don't press it, they tend to want to kind of slide down inside that inside that half. And so periodically I'll press. Um, there isn't really a, a right or a wrong, and you'll kind of figure it out as you go um, what how often you need to press. This is the large, this is the medium, and then this is the small. I'm pretty sure we have the measurements on the website of what those are, but I remembered a tape measure tonight so that I'm like, somebody's going to ask how tall they are. The biggest one is the inside is about 14 inches, medium is about 12 inches, and the small is about 8 inches. So they're a good size to fit even probably on a, a mantle type thing. And there are different pumpkins. We've got different pumpkin molds in there. That just happens to be the set that I'm working with tonight. Um. I think this is about the leaves. Would you still fire them separate if you raccoon? If I raccoon, then I probably would attach those because generally with the raccoon, I'm probably going to do like a wash of glaze over the whole piece and wipe it back. And the leaves done with that technique, if you do like the jade gloss on the leaves and you brush a coat on and you wipe it back, you'll get areas that are the matte black showing, and then you'll get areas with really bright metallic sparkle to them. So in, the, in that case, if I was raccooning, I would probably stick them on there. Now, I would also keep in mind, I have to lift those up with tongs and pull them out of the kiln. So be careful with your leaves, how you leave space so that you'll be able to grab that. Keep that in mind um, that you can either grab it by the stem, if the stem is attached, um, 
that probably would be the easiest to be grabbing them by the stems here, not breaking the leaves off, going around the sides with the tongs. Okay, and I think you said this before, but it's someone said they don't see the in the description that the project kit comes with the press mold, but you said you just forgot to the press tool. I forgot to put that in there, but it does. Yeah, we are we are including okay, that with <laughs> yep with the the kits. Yep. Okay. And um, at their studio, they can't do anything over 11 inches. Can they get the kit with just the one pumpkin, or do they have to order everything? So the all of the items are available individually. They said 11 inches was the yeah, but your so the kit kiln is as far as yeah. So the kit. It. So if you did the yeah the medium and the small pumpkin, once that piece comes out of the mold and it dries and shrinks, that medium pumpkin is probably going to be about 11 inches. Um, it's just the tall pumpkin. So you can order them separately. I don't have a kit set up that doesn't have all three. Um, you would have to probably order those individually. Um, I'm just thinking, though, if you order them individually, it's probably going to be more than if you order yeah, the kit. That's like so in your case, just put a note on your order that you don't need the large pumpkin, um, and we'll figure something something out, some type of a... Uh, a discount a part of yeah else. part of the 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 reason I put these these kits together and the nice thing with the pumpkins is all three of them can nest inside each other and so when I figured the price on this kit it was like okay this is how big the box will be this is how much it'll weigh and so all of that shipping and everything is figured in there too so um, I can probably do some type of a credit if you don't need all three sizes just put a note in there and, and we'll figure it out or send me an email and we'll figure it out okay and what type of glue I think they're talking about glue so the that's a good question for gluing the leaves on and stem on later um, I like to use like a silicone glue um, sometimes it'll be like a marine glue like a, a clear silicone um, like or an, even an e6000 the silicone what's nice about it is it's flexible so if those leaves get bumped they don't snap off as easily as a glue that dries really super hard and doesn't give any flex to those leaves so um, any any thick glue if it's got a rubbery flex to it that's good okay and then um, what type of cold finish metallic paint do you use so the metallic paints that I was talking about in my last live these are the metallic creams and um, you can look back at the the live that I did two weeks ago on the watercolor technique I showed this and then there was another live that I did using these with stencils um, these are a, a a cream that you can use your fingers you can use brushes they're a nice creamy consistency I've got two different kits up there I've got the original 12 colors and then we've got the kit up there that is the nine new colors that just got added about a month ago okay and I think you talked about this but how thick do you make the leaves and how long do you wait to press them in it says but I think maybe they mean on so the leaves between um, an eighth and a quarter of an inch you don't want to go too thin with those if you go too thin they won't peel away from the rubber form just taper the edges of it by pinching your thumb down um, and I I mean you saw like how I was making them and I peeled them away immediately um, I hope that answers your question and then press them onto the pumpkin right away. yeah and then if, if you're going to add them to the pumpkin I would score and slip with slip that's made from this clay body that you're working with and slip those onto the piece to attach them. Yep. Okay, I think that's all. all right. Um, I just want to show you guys a couple other new things then before we go. Um, some of the other things that we added, I had a lot of people asking about fall stencils. We just added, this is a new leaf stencil. These are new, they're, um, what were these? They're, they're 16 and a half inches by six inch. So you can use this like wrapping around stuff. Or you can use just parts of it, I think, on big platters and stuff. Those will be really cool. There's also a big pumpkin one. This is new up on the website. They're in the live event specials as well. There's a new pumpkin stack. There is a new 6x6 six six pumpkin and corn and gourd. And then this one I thought was really cool. This is a new tree stencil. And there's one other tree stencil, a small one that I forgot to grab, that's up there as well. And I didn't get a chance this past weekend to do anything with that. Also want to give you a sneak peek of a new leaf form. Um, this is a Monstera leaf. This is a new one that will be coming out. The reason we haven't released a lot of the new leaves yet is we still haven't gotten the green rubber material from the company. It's been a very long, painful process ordering that material. It's not that they don't have it. It's just been 
setting up an account. I've had, I think, four different account managers now. They've had turnover of people, and I keep filling out forms over and over and over to get everything set up. So um, soon we will be getting the material in. We'll be making these. We'll be making the new rhubarb leaf. We'll be making the new um, larger hydrangea leaf. We'll be making these. I don't even know what these leaves are. I forgot to look these up. I mean, these are some new giant. There's three different sizes of this. We just made molds yesterday for um, some leaves that some oh. people sent. Um, and I'm kind of excited about, but I haven't cast them yet. So uh, Someone asked if that leaf was from the pizza place. But it, it's not, oh, but it is the same. It is the same. It, that it's is a monstera. He, it, it's funny. He actually gave me a leaf. One of the leaves was dying <laughs> on that giant plant. When people come for retreat, we take them for pizza at a local place. And he has this huge plant in the front. He gave me one of the leaves, and the leaf was actually over 28 inches, and it was too big. We can't fit it in the kiln. And so um, I'm waiting for a smaller leaf Did to die on this plant. plant? Like that. I did, and so I bought this Monstera plant. Um, this is the biggest leaf so far that it has mm. generated, but this will be a nice bowl it's the same plant size. Bowl, yep. <laughs> so eventually, we'll get some some bigger sizes of that as well. We've got some new pumpkin leaf molds that are done. Some real big leaves. The giant rhubarb that mold is done. Um, so we're gonna once we get that rubber material in, um, we will be cranking out all those new new leaves, and we're actually caught up with all of our distributor orders now. Um, we've got just a few orders on the website to, to take care of. Um, so we're, we're doing well with the leaves. All the new packaging is done. All the bags are in. Everything is in that everything is shipping now, so. Do you have a finished pumpkin to show? Um, I showed pictures of finished pumpkins. Those original pumpkins I did, I think I put in the post, oh. it was yeah. like, 18 years ago. I, oh, I was no. thinking it was about 20 years ago, but Age advertising the yeah, live. the promo for this live and I'll I'll post a picture in the the comments in here later of the finished pieces on this if you didn't see that. And then if someone is wondering about when an item they or when a kit they ordered from a couple weeks ago from the last class, we'll show you so, watercolor kits. Yep, so we've got order. there's about a um, hundred kits out there packed right now to ship. Um, we shipped a lot of them out. There's a lot more going out. And like I said, we're just waiting then for uh, Thin and Shade to come in from Mako. Duncan Thin and Shade, um, I think, was the only thing that we're missing to finish the rest of the orders. And I'm going to check tomorrow because that order should have shipped. But with Monday being a holiday, I think it's thrown us off by a day. But I'm going to check tomorrow and see if that is shipped. But I'm anticipating that coming in um, early next week. And then we'll get the rest of them shipped out. Everything is pulled and sitting over here with all the slips just waiting for that last item to to finish those but a lot of orders there will be notifications going out tomorrow of the watercolor kits that a lot of you will be getting notifications tomorrow so uh, someone sent you some plant leaves for a money plant which i wish there really was a money plant. <laughs> i don't know if that auto corrected and and they received them yesterday and loved them oh good so, okay yep that was ellen, one of the but, yep ellen yep and i've got some that i just made lynn sent me some leaves mm -hmm. from oregon i think lynn's from oregon um some really cool really cool round leaves with just a ton of texture and so i made those molds yesterday and we will start casting those probably over the weekend and i'll get lynn her samples too so if you've got some really unique leaves send me pictures what i've done with people is if they We'll put them in a, a Ziploc bag with a damp paper towel, send them in a flat rate priority mail envelope. I'll usually get it within three days and the leaves usually hold up very well in a damp paper towel. And then once I have the mold made, I will cast them and send them a free set of the leaves, which more than covers the roughly $10 for, for shipping that those leaves to me. So, but don't just send me leaves. Let me, you know, send me pictures of the leaves that you've got because I've got some leaves coming from other people and I don't want you sending leaves that I don't need. Or when you're not ready for them. Or when I'm not ready for them. Because, <laughs> the, like right now, I'm waiting for more of the material to come in for making the actual molds. It's a very expensive material to make the molds and it's a very long process and a lot of, it takes a lot of time to make the original mold for them. Um, so, uh, yeah, just shoot me an email with pictures of the leaves you got and I'll let you know if I'm interested. All right. Yep. Anything else? No. All right. Well, thanks for joining us tonight, you guys. We'll be back again in a 
couple weeks with some more cool new stuff. And uh, thanks again for joining us, and we will see everybody later.